go ahead and get started by introducing our speaker today, Dr. Allison McGregor. Dr. McGregor took her MD from uh, Boston University in 2003, subsequently joined the faculty at Brown, where she served from 2010 to 2020, uh, rising up to the rank of Professor of Emergency Medicine and the founder and director of the Division of Sex and Gender in Emergency Medicine. Recently, she's moved down to the University of South Carolina as a professor of emergency medicine, associate dean, of faculty affairs and development. She's a co-founder of the Sex and Gender Health Collaborative and author of Sex Matters, a book uh, addressing how male-centric medicine endangers women's health. She's also the author of over 80 peer-reviewed articles on sex, gender, and diversity in medical education and health. And she's joined us today for uh, this week's Dean Seminar. So welcome, Dr. McGregor. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you, Dean Guy, for being intentional about bringing this issue to light for your, um, for your faculty. And, and uh, I think it's really important, obviously. And yes, I did just move. So my new office has nothing decorative on it whatsoever. So um, please excuse the uh, uh, blank background. Um, great, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so um, that's, you just heard the, um, my, a little bit about my bio, and I am uh, now at the University of South Carolina after being in Rhode Island at Brown for over 18 years. So I'm now um, don't need a shovel um, or an ice pick, which has really um, been really uh, wonderful this particular um, winter. Okay, so I thought I would really focus this to um, drug safety and efficacy, and um, clearly because uh, most of you are in the uh, pharmaceutical and pharmacy um, uh, industry, and so, and there's a lot of this a um, lot of evidence of this out there. So um, I really wanna get through it to um, have some uh, Q&A and discussion afterwards. That's always my favorite. Um, so let's um, get going. And so when we think about this, I think about this as I'm coming from an emergency medicine perspective. So this is really about my um, career and seeing um, patients of all genders and, and all sizes and all ages coming in with um, the entire spectrum of illness and conditions and disease. And um, as I began to sort of craft my uh, understanding and, and, and understanding of medicine and health, I really became quite aware of some disparities uh, in the delivery and our understanding of, uh, of um, humans. So that's where this is coming from. So um, just to start off with the way things were. So I really find that it's important to um, bring, bring everybody from the beginning. Um, I don't make assumptions anymore that people know, um, know anything already. So, um, you know, we know this question, men and women are not the same, but when I say this, I'm thinking of this in a very specific way. We were taught that when um, the sperm meets the egg and um, a new life forms, um, it'll be the chromosomes of either XX or XY, and they will decide whether um, the individual has ovaries or testes, and then that will regulate testosterone or estrogen, and that will create secondary sex characteristics, hair, facial hair, breast development, that sort of thing. And other than that, we were thought that we were other, uh, pretty much the same. But when I'm practicing medicine and I'm out there, I see that the truth is that, you know, um, that is, uh, we are not the same in many, many ways outside of our reproductive system. 78% of all autoimmune diseases occur in women. Um, men are 30 times more likely to die of sudden cardiac death during exercise than women. Cardiomyopathy, the mechanisms of heart disease now are known to be different. Um, women suffer from migraines at, at a, um, a huge proportionally greater uh, numbers than men. So even when a disease occurs in both men or women, someone seems to have a, a greater incidence or a greater severity than the other. 
So we're looking at why. Well, first we have to realize that um, what happened. So this is a very grim photo and it's meant to be because we weren't very good at doing human subject research um, early on. And think of uh, the times of World War II and the concentration camps. There was a lot of experimenting going on. There was no such thing as informed consent. Um, if you think of Tuskegee studies and you know, with holding penicillin from African-American men with syphilis. And so the National Research Act around 1973 was designed to create informed consent, designed to protect humans subjects in research, um, which was very helpful. But what also happened at this time is they labeled women as protected subjects because we had those um, teratogenic effects, those examples of um, thalidomide and uh, TES. And so they thought, okay, well, let's, um, let's have informed consent, but let's just make sure that we are protecting women. And so that's what started to happen. But it was also this time frame in history when we really started developing our large cardiovascular trials and our large stroke trials and our understanding of cancer. And so researchers were pretty um, happy to study men because they weren't considered as variable as women at the time. Um, you wouldn't have to enroll many more women to control the for the stage of the menstrual cycle if you um, you know if you just had men. So it was pretty much embraced that um, research was done on men and the results were applied to women. And I love this slide and so I use it all the time because what happened is that um, what, what can't we study in men? Well, we can't study having a baby or uh, menopause or menstruation or even um, to a great extent, uh, breast health. So we had to study those things in women. And what happened was it, it really siloed all of the efforts to provide medical care for women into only those issues. So women were really, um, you know, even now, if you ask women, what is your greatest health concern? They're probably going to say breast cancer um, when heart disease is the number one killer for both men and women. Um, and so what happened is by trying to protect women, we actually did them a disservice. And so what happened? Um, why, why, was, why is that such a big deal? Uh, and so I use this example for you because of, um, uh, because you're pharmacists. And so um, a lot of my examples will be from um, medications. And so for many of you, you probably are familiar with the QT interval. If you're not, I'm gonna explain it very simply. So every time the heart beats, it has to relax, um, restore, repolarize, so it can beat again. And that relaxing time is um, measured as the QT interval on an EKG. Pretty simple. However, as the UQT interval prolongs, if it gets too long, it can lead to a fatal arrhythmia called torsades to point. Um, and that is not compatible with life, as you can see from the bottom, that's um, not, not going to perfuse your brain. And so um, what's interesting is that women have a longer QT interval on average than men. And this is something that um, starts at puberty. Um, during puberty, boys get a surge in testosterone, that surge in testosterone upregulates potassium channels all in the heart muscle and the myocardium, which causes a faster repolarization and a quicker recovery time. And it shortens their QT interval for as long as they have that testosterone um, protection. And so um, women um, have a longer QT on average. And then when you think about what else can prolong those QT interval, it's medications. Um, and so many, many medications prolong the QT interval. And it just so happens that women are um, taking way more uh, uh, prescription medications than men. So there's this real concern, especially when women come into the emergency department, they're more likely to have lots of specialists, they're more likely to be on multiple prescription medications. And then if I don't think of it as their physician and I start giving them new medications, um, this puts this at great risk. And so what happened was the government accountability study actually looked at drugs withdrawn from the market after they've been out. And what they found was that 80% of the drugs withdrawn from the market were withdrawn because of adverse effects in women. And now half of them were 
prescribed solely to, to women. And so um, they obviously um, had some effects there, but um, the other half were prescribed to both men and women, but the women had the adverse drug reactions. And so I wanted to see what type of drug reactions are we talking about? And we're talking about things as fatal as torsades and torsades and torsades. Um, or liver failure or alveolar heart disease. We're not talking about nausea or an upset stomach, right? This is something that has not been taken into account because we have been studying men who have protective QT intervals. So the um, uh, Food and Drug Administration actually said, okay, well, you know, we've been doing some things to try to prevent this from happening. And so what they did was recently in 2021, uh, members of the FDA looked at, again, let's relook at um, the drugs that are withdrawn from the market and to see if there's any improvement. And number one, there's a demographic rule from the time that that happened to, to now, which um, was the NIH Revitalization Act, which actually said we should start to include women into later stages of the men, of the clinical trials. Um, so phase three, um, and you know, and maybe some diverse individuals, um, and so that sort of started to remove that protective subject uh, label, um, and so they wanted to see what effect that had. Also, they established uh, protocols to actually in, um, ensure that the investigation of the QT interval prolongation is part of the process, as well as the DILI, which is the drug-induced liver injury, as part of the process of a drug approval. Um, and then the FDA has established something called drug trial snapshots, which is their way of becoming transparent. Um, and I'll show you an example a website that they are advertising to the public that says, hey, you know that drug that you just got prescribed by your doctor? Um, come on our website and we'll show you the clinical trial that we use to approve that drug. Um, and you can see it um, uh, separated out by age, sex, and race. Uh, but there are some problems with that. So this actually caused a 67% reduction in adverse uh, um, events. But then we have an example like Ambien, which um, Ambien is a, um, is a flagship example for this. So Zolpidem, you know, it was on the market for over 20 years, uh, being prescribed mostly to women because women are more likely to be diagnosed with sleep disorders than men. Um, but the original studies were done in men. And so what happened was there were thousands of post-market um, reports that said that these women are waking up in the morning with impaired drowsiness. So then they're getting in the car and they are having motor vehicle crashes. And so what happened was they investigated this. And what they discovered is that if they, um, when they gave the same drug um, concentration, so the approval um, uh, amount was 10 milligrams. When they gave 10 milligrams of Zolpidem to a male and 10 milligrams of Zolpidem to a female, um, and they checked it, say, four hours later or whatever the bottle says, you should, um, you should have enough time for sleep, women had two times the serum concentration of the drug compared to men. So what does that mean? That means that this is life a death again right? By merely not looking at sex-specific dosing, um, we have then put all these women at risk. So the FDA, this was their first sex-specific dosing recommendation, and they recommended that women get five milligrams and men get 10 milligrams. And I think about over those 20 years, how many motor vehicle crashes have I taken care of the patients in them um, where this could have been prevented? A motor vehicle crash is is serious stuff. It's it's um, it puts people into grave danger and crisis states. So again, this is the reality of thinking about how our research has been conducted and making sure that it's not set up for bias. So then the NIH said in 2016, okay, let's 
forget about the fact that we should add women uh, into the later stages of the clinical trials, we need to make sure that we understand the mechanisms of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and um, enzymatic processes. Uh, so we need to really make sure that we have um, uh, preclinical studies on our animals and make sure our animal models are female as well, and make sure that our cell lines are understood which chromosomal complement do they have. So they said that if you are um, applying for funding from the NIH, you must include sex as a biological variable um, in your application and uh, across the whole spectrum. So that was at least a good um, uh, st uh, standard. Of course, you don't need NIH funding to do research. Um, however, it's a good standard from our major funding agency in the United States. And then we're learning this. Um, so here's just an example of a medication, uh, naltrexone, which is high dose. Um, so they're looking at high dose naltrexone, which is an oral form of naloxone, Narcan. And what they, um, this particular researcher wanted to look at is in um, the bottom access uh, time and in the um, vertical access, how much cocaine use do people do? And they thought, well, what if we gave this drug to um, individuals that have cocaine use disorders, it might help prevent them from using as much. Let's check it out. So what they first did though, was they gave a placebo to both men and women. And they found that they did about the same amount of, of cocaine. Um, and the placebo, there really wasn't too much of a difference. So then they gave the study drug to men and they found that it decreased the amount of cocaine use that they did. But when they gave the study drug to women, it increased the amount of cocaine that they were using. And so this is a great visual of what would have happened if this researcher pulled the results together, right? It would show no difference. We would lose out on something potentially beneficial for men while being harmful to women. So this is what is meant by um, analyzing results based on sex. When you don't do that, when you just pull your data together, you're assuming that there's no difference between men and women. And so this was a great example in nature. And let's use the same example for this. So if the bottom access is time and A is placebo and B is the study drug, and then the measured variable would be cocaine use. When you're pooling them, say you were, were to um, unveil, right? you were to just like, showcase um, who is actually in the you are making the assumption that it's going to be equally distributed. So for instance, if you gave the placebo in A, that males and females would just distribute themselves out. And if you gave the study drug to B, that they would just um, um, uh, you know, uh, distribute themselves without. However, when you stratify by sex, now we have the ability to make other conclusions based on this data. That's why we do research, is so that we can get closer to understanding mechanisms and, and make accurate conclusions. So what if when you unveiled it and you did sex specific analysis um, and you gave the placebo in here, women were blue and men were orange. So what if you gave the placebo and women did more cocaine on average? And then you gave the study drug and it had the opposite effect. What if you gave the placebo and uh, men did more cocaine on average? And then you gave the study drug and it had no effect. Or it could have been the opposite effect where with placebo, it just um, uh, distributes out evenly. And then when you gave the study drug, uh, women did less cocaine than men. Now, this is really the crux of what we're talking about. This is going to get at um, uh, research that is reproducible and responsible science. Now let's take a look at the um, drug trial snapshots. And, um, and let me just show you an example of what it can look like. And so these are real um, study drugs that were on there. And so it's pretty neat. You can look at drug A and see that here, of course, it's the opposite again. So women are orange and blue is men. And um, you, see, you can say and say, oh, I was just prescribed this cardiac medication. Let me see. Oh, um, gosh, there's 88% there's women that were enrolled in that. Um, is that is that good for me? Um, or there's 50-50, should that be the right 
ratio or or 74 percent were were um, uh, enrolled that were men um you know and and the fda is asking us to ask our um, doctors whether this drug is right for us. Now, I am a physician and I look at this and I don't know because was it analyzed by sex? I need to know more about the construct of the, of the study um, to be able to say that, that, um, that this was good or, or, or not good. So now where are we? We've moved into um, the, you know, there is a sex difference. So once we discover there's a sex difference, um, like naltrexone, like zolpidem, um, we now get to think about what's the source of that sex difference. That's what's going to lead to greater understanding and generalizability of the outcome, right? That's what we're thinking now. It's not just like, great, there's a sex difference. Now it's like, where is that coming from? And there are several areas that are um, that could be attributed to it. One, it's the biological sex in your DNA, your DNA card that's in every cell in your body. What chromosomal complement do you have? Do you have XX or XY? How does that affect your liver metabolism of drugs? Um, animal studies have shown that there are over a thousand liver enzymes that have sexual dimorphism, which means they're different between males and females outside of the reproductive productive um, uh, uh, components. Um, you know, what does it mean for kidney excretion of drugs? We know that men secrete um, uh, acetaminophen 33% faster. Um, they, they secrete uh, benzodiazepines faster and, and, um, and, and many drugs. Um, maybe it has to do with the stomach lining and the pH. We know that there's differences in gastric emptying time. There's differences in the way that the, those um, chromosomes affect heart disease and your brain. And we also know that they affect the way that your lungs respond to COVID. It's very fascinating. Or is the sex difference related to hormones? Remember, this was the thing that we've pretty much ignored. Um, so hormones evolve over a lifetime. And, um, and if you look at the males uh, to the right, the males that are 20, 30, and 40 with very stable testosterone levels, that has been our group that we've studied. That has, we have based our understanding of health and disease on those individuals. Men have daily uh, variations of testosterone. Women have monthly and lifetime um, uh, huge differences. And we know that hormones have, can have major effects on metabolism of drugs, on uh, susceptibility to infections. For instance, um, anti-epileptic drugs. So I, I see people come in with breakthrough seizures all the time. And what we do is we tell them, um, uh, don't drive until you follow up with your neurologist, or we say, okay, let's increase the drug of your anti-epileptic without really thinking about, well, if this is a female, um, maybe they are um, having different uh, um, metabolic makeup depending on where they are in their menstrual cycle. And so this was very interesting because this, this study showed um, the effects that the um, drug can have on um, endogenous uh, or exogenous estrogen and progesterone and the other way around. So for instance, um, lamotrigine, um, the effect of, of having those hormones around decreases the effectiveness of lamotrigine to 40 to 60%. Whereas something like um, oxcarbazepine, I say this, I don't really say this. I think I say the, um, the uh, brand name, but um, uh, that can actually have effect on the um, uh, effects of the effectiveness of, of birth control, right? These are big deals. Um, and so if we just in, embrace this in our understanding and in, in, in our dosing regimens, we would have um, much more tailored treatments pro, for, for, for women. This was an interesting algorithm uh, that for a lamotrigine that says, okay, maybe we should be uh, um, adjusting this based on um, how during pregnancy, um, you know, when oral contraceptives are used or not. Um, and just created this whole protocol that I think um, is, is a great example of embracing these differences that we have in hormonal regulation, um, that we have in sex. 
Um, and so um, maybe the sex difference is due to the environment that we're in. Um, so uh, gender, for instance, how you present yourself in society, these are all environmental factors and not all of them are visible, but some of them are, and that does affect your health and access to healthcare. If you're a woman that wears a burqa in your society, then that's covering your skin. So that's going to decrease your vitamin D levels, um, but it will also decrease your skin cancer um, risks. So these things are part of our societal and, and affect our health and disease. Um, keeping that in mind, when we think about a transgender patient, that means that their sex and their gender is discordant. So they'll have one biological sex, XX or XY, and then a different um, uh, gender identity. And so I loved this paper. It was, you know, by pharmacists, um, hospital-based pharmacists that look at electronic um, health records um, in, the, in, in hospitalized patients. And they, they thought, well, what happens if a transgendered individual is taking exogenous hormones? Does that change the metabolism of the drugs? So if they're taking gender forming hormone therapy and they discovered that um, if someone was taking gender affirming hormone therapy for six months or more, that it affected the renal clearance and the ideal body weight. And so they thought, okay, after six months to calculate the creatinine clearance, based on the gender that they're transforming into, not their biological sex. And so these are the things that we should be collecting in our electronic health records and understanding and, 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 and embracing so that way we can have less um, uh, effects that, you know, um, and have more, be more effective. Is the sex difference due to anthropometry? So this is the, des the design of our world. Who designed the chair that I'm sitting on? Did they take my body and my, um, uh, and my um, preferences in mind? And um, nowhere is this more evident than in crash test dummies. So we have yet to have uh, a female adult crash test dummy as part of our testing process. And so what has that done? Well, car manufacturers are designing their cars to pass these tests. And so if these tests are designed to protect a male, um, average male uh, um, physical body, what it's, 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 it's horrific. This just like, this drives me nuts. So if you are a female sitting in the front seat, you are 22% more likely to have a, um, than men to have a head injury, 44% uh, more likely to have a neck injury, 38% more likely to have an abdominal injury, right? Um, we are, uh, if you are sitting in the front seat or the passenger and you are a woman, you are 73% more likely to be seriously injured and 17% more likely to be killed than a male. Why? Because women sit closer up to the dashboard. You know, we're shorter. We have wider pelvic girdles, which just affect the impact. Um, men have stronger neck muscles, so they're able to have less uh, whiplash. This is the design of our environment that was also male-centric and affects things that we never even thought of. Then lastly, there's the observer interaction, which to me is also fascinating, even though I find all this fascinating. This one is um, really interesting and new and, and kind of cloudy, but um, what is the gender of the physician? Um, how does that interact with the gender of the patient? This also happens in uh, animal studies. Um, they've looked at when the research assistant was a male that the mice responded differently to their tests because they could smell the pheromones of the male research assistant. How, how many people have included that into the understanding of the study, right? Um, we know that when you have a, a, a woman patient and a male doctor and the woman sees this male doctor, she's more likely to increase the volume of her pain complaint. Um, and what we know is that when a male doctor sees a woman patient, um, that they're more likely to, to decrease the volume of the, um, the pain. So there's this negotiation thing that happens like, oh, she probably always, you know, acts like this. And she's like, oh, I have to really make sure that he thinks I'm serious. And, and there's this, there's this really interesting um, dynamic. So I wanted you to realize that where we are, um, we are now, our future is about looking at the source of these sex differences, because 
the social sciences and the medical sciences are the worst at reproducibility. They're only about 40% reproducible. So maybe these are the keys that we've been missing to really get a hold of these, uh, you know, these diseases that have high public health significance that I see all the time. Um, this might be a major key. And so I love this because I thought it was very complicated. Um, it's an illustration in a pharmaceutical review um, journal. And I thought you might like it because it really just in one figure outlines everything that I just said. So um, age and race, even gut microbiome that is different between um, males and females. It's really fascinating. The chromosomes, how that affects pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, um, the hormones, are we even thinking of those? And then the position gender, you know, that communication might even just um, um, affect your response to therapy. So what were the consequences of um, not realizing that these were important factors? The consequences is that doctors have been thinking that they're practicing evidence-based medicine, right? Even a pharmacist, but evidence-based medicine. That's been our, our crux, right? That's what we believe in. But what is our evidence based upon when 76% of cell-based researchers do not even know the cell of the sex that they're working on? When 80% of animal models are still male animals? When human clinical trials, yes, we are enrolling women more than ever before, but we're not analyzing them based on sex. We're sprinkling them in and calling that um, equivalent. Women make up over half the population, and we're the healthcare deciders uh, for the families, really. And so how generalizable has this research been to my patients, you know, or to me? Um, or to anyone that is outside of that particular you know, majority viewpoint. Let's look at cardiovascular disease. It's still the number one killer for both men and women. But why is it that the mortality rates are pers persistently elevated in women compared to men? Right. So when we think about that now and we see this one trend, we can think of, well, maybe it's because we were taught that this is what a heart attack looks like, that it looks like a white man, maybe it's a little metabolic syndrome, clutching his chest. That's what I was taught, the Levine sign. And so when I was a resident and medical student and junior faculty member, and I'm really trying to understand patterns of recognition of disease so that I can be a good doctor, that is what I was looking for. In fact, this past year, I was asked to review some um, medical school um, and residency um, learning modules uh, to get ready for the, um, uh, the, the exams. And um, I said, oh, can I just take a look at some, some of your modules? And this is what is still being taught in 2022, right? This is the same look. This is a male, um, you know, who's white, who has metabolic syndrome, who has the classic symptoms of heart disease, right? Um, you know, and then this other, you know, sense of doom, this dyspnea, it's, it's, um, there's, there's a lack of inclusion and integration of all this new evidence into our education system. And that is um, you know, detrimental because this is what a heart attack looks and feels like to a woman. Um, and I was thinking, gosh, unusual fatigue, um, uh, shortness of breath, nausea. I mean, I'm not gonna think of a heart attack I wasn't taught that that's what a heart attack looks like. So, um, so really that has major effects. Um, and then um, this was a very extensive um, uh, publication of the um, differences in the effects of cardiovascular disease. And I hope that by now you've seen that this um, should not have said gender. Right, so if we're looking at um, effects of drugs, we're looking at sex, um, and the terminology has evolved. Like, it wasn't until the NIH started to really embrace sex as a biological variable where that became the biological um, a sense um, that every cell has a sex, um, and so people, you know, and researchers really got used to using the word gender, but now they mean very specific things. 
And so I thought this was interesting. If you look at, again, they said gender differences, um, but they're looking at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And you look at all of these differences in drug bioavailability, body composition for sure. How does that affect drug distribution and drug transporters, um, metabolizing enzymes and drug excretion? All of these things should be important differences that we are embracing into our understanding. And then they go back to sex-related differences. But um, look at all of these drug classes um, that have different outcomes in women. For, a, for example, labetalol. The concentrations are 80% higher in women. I use this drug. I use this drug um, IV. I use it a lot in, in my clinical practice. I, I didn't know that. Um, until I looked at it and, and, and we're not taught that maybe there should be a dose change. Procainamide, the plasma levels are higher in women because they have lower BMIs and, and you know, their volume of distribution is different. Um, where, and then of course, Zolpidem. So now we have one drug that has sex-specific dosing recommend, recommendations. Where are the other ones? Um, and then again, these are sex differences um, uh, also. And so aspirin, I find this one to be um, particularly interesting because there can be different even indicators uh, for a drug. So aspirin has been shown to be um, great and protective for primary prevention of stroke in women, but not of heart disease in women. So, um, you know, I see all these women taking aspirin who have not had a primary um, cardiac event, and they're just doing it because their doctor told them to, they think that it's good, but the benefits are not there. Um, ibuprofen, less effective in women, who knew, right? So, um, or is it due to the fact that physiologically, we have different mechanisms of disease? We know that the way that plaque forms is different between um, males and females. Um, females have more of a diffuse plaque. Think about the way that men and women um, um, distribute their, their body fat. Men, it's usually very um, focal in their abdomen. Women, it's much more diffuse. The same thing is going on in the coronary arteries. However, when you squirt dye into the diagram on the B, it's going to look like it's clean. The dye is going to go straight through when your angiogram, is, you're going to be told you don't have heart disease. Um, we've really sort of um, latched onto this anatomical definition of heart disease um, and anatomical treatment, um, which is not the case for many women. So here's an example of a um, patient case. So there's a woman, she's at work, she develops um, some chest discomfort, not pain, but it's, it's uncomfortable. And so she's talked into going to the emergency department, which is a lot. I mean, the fluorescent lights, the, the sirens, the, it's, it's an intimidating environment. So she decides to go. So she goes and um, the doctor says, gosh, you look nervous. And I see that on your um, past medical history here that you have anxiety. So let me give you some Valium. Um, and she's like, okay. Um, I mean, I do have lots of um, uh, deadlines at work and so whatever, you're the doctor. And so the doctor checks back and says, how are you feeling? And, and she says, you know, it's, it didn't stop the pain. And so the doctor says, okay, well, um, I see here that you take um, over the counter renincidine. So, um, uh, let's just, this could be your GERD. Let's give you Maalox and lidocaine. And so now she has a numb throat, nothing happened with the pain. So then the doctor says, well, you mentioned you're a new grandmother and you've been picking up the toddler. Here's some ibuprofen. Uh, it must be musculoskeletal. When I press here, you say, ouch. Okay, great. Now she's starting to look more in pain and starting to look bad. So the doctor says, well, let me get an EKG. Let me start to do something. But in the meantime, here's some morphine um, without realizing that women have um, greater incidences of nausea and vomiting and uh, respiratory depression. So now she needs to be put on the monitor and oxygen and she needs some medication for the nausea. And then finally, she might get some nitroglycerin, which is gonna give her a headache. So then she needs some Tylenol. So this is the this is a problem. This is polypharmacy. None of these have been really tested together. This is also the fact that we because we are not used to understanding the female patterns of disease and female presentations, we're just sort of seeing what sticks. Um, and think about the QT interval here. Think about what the female patient thinks. This is what she thinks. She thinks she's told it's anxiety. She should take a nap. Um, uh, maybe it's all in her head. Um, maybe it's her period. Um, and so 
that's been a huge problem. Women feel very dismissed by the medical field and rightly, rightly so. So what else is missing quickly? There's bias in the entire system. Um, there's bias in our AI that we, um, artificial intelligence that we rely upon. There's bias in the electronic medical records of what we put in. And we're, a lot of people are now using them to make decisions. Um, they're biased in, in your to, um, learning tools, in your, um, in your, uh, in your apps. Um, this is everywhere. Um, and so, for instance, um, you know, if you, as we start to really um, uh, get robust um, AI, um, uh, we have to keep in mind um, who, who, who was the study, who, who was, this, was the technology studied on? Was it a, a, a small population? And then a larger population is going to be using it because that can exacerbate existing biases that are out there. For instance, this was a fascinating um, study that looked at smartphones and they grabbed four or five smartphones from all the different companies and they asked it two, two sets of questions. One was like, okay, uh, physical health. Um, hey Siri, um, I, uh, of course my Siri just went on. I have, um, I have chest pain um, or I have a headache. And then- Now so playing a lot by 21 Savage. Okay. <laughs> and then Siri says, um, uh, would you like me to call your doctor? Um, would, would you like directions to the nearest emergency department? But when they asked the smartphones, um, things like mental health or things that are related mostly to women, like I've been raped, um, like I'm depressed. Um, they had no, they had no internal technology. They had no internal code for that. And so they relate that back to male dominated STEM fields. And so I think it's really important for us to just start to uncover and, and, and look at um, how, how our world was designed. Um, and so, and including um, textbooks. So um, my textbooks in medical school all had um, images of, of white men um, and then an insert for females uh, reproductive organs, right? It hasn't really changed that much, um, which, is a, which is a problem. So um, especially because when you graduate from medical school, you have to take care of patients that don't look like that too. Um, and so we really need to get better at, at doing that. Are we adapting in real time? Um, the adverse drug reactions, these are the, the greatest risk factors for still having them. It's liver or renal disease, makes sense to me. Age, makes sense to me. Polypharmacy, for sure. Um, and just being female um, increases your risk of an adverse drug reaction still 50 to 75% of the time. And so here's another image of sex differences in adverse drug reactions in diabetic drugs. And you can see this goes both ways. This is not just about improving health for women. It is because we have a lot of catching up to do, but this is about good science and really just thinking about um, men and women as having uh, different physiological and metabolic needs. Um, most of these, the women is larger, which is um, sensing that that um, it's indicating that more women have that adverse event. But look at all the systems that are involved. Um, it's, it's really an, a, an amazing. Same, same um, study as before. This was an example of adverse drug reactions based on sex. And you can see digoxin, for instance, higher mortality in women with heart failure. Um, th these, aren't, these aren't little. Um, COVID, uh, this was a look at um, uh, COVID-19 trials of antivirals, of antimalarials, of immune modulators. And so here was a chance to really look at this um, and, and discover something in real time, um, which of course uh, didn't happen. Um, so a quarter of the studies had uh, t twice as many men enrolled than women. Um, no one really designed it for sex stratification and only one person uh, did it post hoc. Um, and then zero of them looked for any sort of effect modification by sex. So this is a problem. And I know we really wanted to be quick with this and um, save lives, um, but we have the ability to do this in real time. We, we do. Um, and you know what, it's just, it's, we have a moral obligation to do it as well. Finishing with how to evolve. 
um, here's what I think needs to happen. So um, looking at some of these other uh, evidence that um, when you have this, this, this these people looked at 1.5 million scientific publications, and they revealed that when the first author and the last author was a woman, that the study was more likely to look at sex and gender analysis. Women think of women. Women think of these particular issues. And so really connecting this with opportunities for women to join STEM and to be part of the coders and to be part of the researchers and to um, um, you know, help to have diversity when you're, when you're enrolling um, clinical trials. Um, if, if you go to um, you know, the suburbs in a Home Depot and you're trying and you're a white man and you're enrolling white men, that's a great place to do it. Um, but if you want diversity in clinical trials, you need to go to where diversity is. We need to make sure that the people who are enrolling um, also look diverse. So this is, you know, going out to communities, going out to churches, going out to, um, you know, wherever there is uh, the, the diversity. Um, I mentioned the textbook example and um, this um, uh, was one particular study that looked at um, the when the editors were women, then then there were pictures of women in the books. And so this is what I mean by 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 um, joining this effort um, together. I think will 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 really make make a difference. Um, terminology matters. Um, we've been taught that um, men have typical disease and that women have atypical disease if it's not similar to men's. Um, there's a simple brain switch here that I want you to do, which is there's typical patterns of disease for men, and then there's typical patterns of disease for women. And we should be using the word atypical for any variations based on that. Women are not small men. Women have been considered a subgroup of men for a very long time. And like I said, we make up more than half the population. So this was a really great one from cardiovascular pharmacotherapy, suggestions to improve our understanding. This was 2007 and it's so fitting and it's still it's not done. Um, so again, like I've mentioned, increasing the number of women recruited in all phases of clinical trials. Design a trial to include outcomes important for women and men. Consider sex differences in pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Um, uh, consider interactions with exogenous and endogenous sex hormones. Polypharmacy is really big and totally not appreciated. Um, and then disseminate those results, integrate that into the way that we're educating our pharmacists, we're educating our nurses and our dentists and our doctors. Um, let's get more sex specific do dosing recommendations. Um, we, we, have the, we have the ability to understand that we have the technology to be able to help us with that. And make sure that all of these things are included in guidelines, what kind of guidelines, uh, journal guidelines, um, um, IRB guidelines, um, and any sort of uh, uh, peer review guidelines, whatever your, um, uh, if you have any sort of, um, uh, if you're in, in a um, education committee guidelines, you know, wherever your sphere of influence is, I think that it's important to just bring these up for good science. We, we, the one thing I think everybody really appreciates, uh, both scientists and doctors and pharmacists, is that we evolve. This used to be the way that we um, conducted surgery, right? A bunch of men wearing their suits. There's nothing sterile. There's um, no anesthesia. I mean, we, we evolve. Will we ever not wear masks? No. I mean, in, in, in the clinical environment, I don't think that's ever going to change. Um, and I'm thankful for that because now I'm not inhaling, um, you know, all of these viruses, you know, just by trying to care for patients. So I think that um, when, when I use the, when I'm, when I'm trying to create awareness um, from very smart people, I use this concept of it's really just the next um, evolution of our understanding of science and health and disease. And thank you for mentioning my book. Um, I did write, um, I have a medical textbook called Sex and Gender and Acute Care Medicine. And then I wrote Sex Matters for the lay public because I really thought by the time I'm making changes of doing science and trying to get it into the um, education of medical systems, um, you know, I'm still showing up at work every day and, and, and it's not changing. And so um, this is really designed to empower women to, um, to get the most out of their medical care um, and to take control and to feel like they're empowered to do so. 
So, okay, I've got, I, I managed 10 minutes. Um, so that that's it. And I, I'm, I love questions, comments. Um, is this all new for you? Is this old hat? Um, any thoughts? I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain. That was a great, great presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, do you think that um, women physicians are more in tune to specifics with women patients? Um, so the literature has shown that in several instances, uh, three that I can name off the top, which is in heart attack care, in um, post-surgical care, and in um, inpatient um, uh, care from Medicare registry, that when you had a female, uh, a woman patient with a woman uh, physician, that the women patient had better outcomes than if they had a male physician. And so the thoughts are that are not that women are necessarily better doctors. They look at it and they and the thought is, well, women are more likely to follow evidence-based and hospital based guidelines. Um, also, maybe it's just the conversation. Um, you know, um, women tend to um, uh, do the do the recommendations, follow the advice from the physician if there's a connection there. And so women to women, maybe there might be more of a connection. But I, I, I won't say that that's, that's across the board. We all have our implicit and explicit bias. And we've been teaching um, women physicians um, this old male-centric paradigm. So, um, so that's part of the, you know, that's part of what the, what their their pattern recognition they 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 spent you know uh, 10 15 years trying to get pattern recognition and good clinical acumen but that was based on just men so um so the answer is yes um and no and um it, it's it's a work in progress so i'm surprised that um gynecology and obstetrics is not included though in your list where there's been a difference but that's not included huh um, a difference in the list of which piece? Of women doing better with women physicians. Oh, um, I, I tend to really focus on um, a, um, the, bringing home the point of non-reproductive issues. However, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, obstetrics and gynecology was a male-dominated um, specialty. So was emergency medicine for the longest time. Um, and that is not the case, uh, especially in, in obstetrics and gynecology. It's um, the minority now that go into it are, are males. So I think that there's, there's definitely been a push for um, women to to um, maybe choose to have a, a female woman, another woman physician as well. But um, it's, it's across all the spectrums of, of the specialties. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I had some chest pain and my husband who happens to be Kip <laughs> made me go in and my female APRN and her medical assistant flipped out and hooked up to the EKG and it looked like it was fine. So they went and consulted with the male MD who said, oh, honey, and I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm an associate professor here. <laughs> I've been working in mental health for many years. And they said, well, I think you're just anxious. And I said, no, I'm breathless when I'm walking between my clinics and after I'm seeing kids. And he goes, no, you're just anxious. So luckily I'm married to the Dean and my division chief and then the Dean of the College of Medicine flipped out and I was seen by all women, a female cardiologist. Um, my echo team was all women and got diagnosed with Friends medals, which is kind of, you know, mm -hmm. but they were so ready and it, and it was so um, just really awful the way they were, you know, no, it's all in your head. so. And we've been reading your book. In fact, I think I need to buy, you know, like a, a flat of them to start handing them out to people because it's just, anyway, very, it just, we're so happy you're here. We wish you could have been here in person. We would have had you over to the house. I know, I know. I know. Thank you. I, I, I do too. Um, I know we were going to taste some bourbon, even though I don't yeah. drink. 
I would I would still taste it. Um, and, and your your example is it's so common. It, it's heartbreaking, really, for me. Um, women. Uh, so doctors were taught that women um, are protected from heart heart attacks until they're postmenopausal. So so that option of a cause for your for your chest discomfort, your shortness of breath, isn't even doesn't even come up to the surface. So they just uh, call it anxiety. Now, anxiety. Women have this emotional expression. You know, uh, um, environmentally, we express ourselves more. So, so yes, you might have been anxious because you were having a heart attack. Um, Prince mental angina is a heart attack. It blocks, you know, the the catecholamines shut down the artery and you're not getting um, blood supply. So I think we have to just think about the ways that women have heart disease. Women have something called SCAD. Women have microvascular disease. All of these things, you know, you can have heart attacks. Uh, you can be a 40 year old healthy woman and have a heart attack. And so um, I think that's why I think it's so important to just um, change that, that, that paradigm that I know, but look what I showed, we're still teaching it. It's um, that's why it, it becomes dire. And, and I think taking things into your own account, one of the things I say in the book also is to um, bring an advocate with you. So, um, and when they're like, it's your anxiety, um, you know, Dean Guy could say, um, no, she's not an anxious person or she does have anxiety, but it's the, this is different than <clears throat> what her normal anxiety looks like. Um, just to really advocate until, until we can really change the system uh, as a whole. Yeah, and certainly, you know, I have the advantage of colleagues who know me and you know, I've said, oh no, Dr. Allen is not, that is not her. And, you know, this is something very serious and we need to take care of it. And because of my privilege, I was able to get in and, you know, right. straight out. Exactly. Think about all the, the, the people without privilege um, and, and are the minorities and don't, um, you know, have, have that ability. That's it's everywhere. Dr. McGregor, you have a question in the chat. Are you aware of any research on sex differences among physicians and how they write their notes in an EMR? Can you detect these differences in language? Oh, that's fascinating. Um, I, I, that is really fascinating. I, I have not looked into that. With the EMR though, there's a lot of copy and pasting. Um, so it's not very, um, there's not a ton of prose. But I bet there would be differences in in the way that um, uh, uh, the way that it looks. In fact, you're just giving me an idea for a study um, because I know that men and women um, they um, I, I know what's been looked at um, several times is in a trauma room um, when you have a female physician or a male physician and that communication style and their respect. Um, is very different. So they've looked at different trends of, of um, language and, and effectiveness. Um, so I, I bet it's probably in there too, but it would be a lot of, um, that's a great student um, uh, study. Invite me to co-author. I, okay. I, posted the, I posted the question. Okay. All right, Chris Thank Delter. You. Okay. Yep. Being a little biased, you want him as a co-author, but... Uh, we're, we're at time, so please join me in thanking Dr. McGregor for joining us. Either. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I'm always available uh, just uh, via email. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to me. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.